Life's Abyss, and then you dive. That was the slogan for the cast and crew of The Abyss, James Cameron's 1989 sci-fi epic about the crew of a deep sea drilling rig that have to stop Kyle Reese and his mighty Tash from nuking a bunch of watery aliens. And who can blame them, really? The Abyss has gone down in history as one of the most famously difficult and dangerous productions of all time, a perfect storm of overbearing perfectionist director, technical disasters, punishing work schedules, budget and time overruns, near-fatal accidents, and multiple nervous breakdowns. In short, it's a perfect candidate for another instalment of... PRODUCTION HELL! So because it's fun to peel back the curtain and expose just how badly movie making can go wrong, let's get right into this, shall we? The idea for The Abyss first came to James Cameron when he was a teenager and he heard a lecture about a deep sea diver who used experimental breathing fluid to go much deeper than anyone had before. <laughs> Keep your porn movie jokes to yourself on this one. He kicked around various ideas over the years until he happened to see a documentary about deep sea submersibles while he was in the middle of filming Aliens. This reignited his passion for the old idea and he quickly got to work on the script for what would become The Abyss. His basic concept revolved around a crew of blue-collar workers on a submerged oil rig at the bottom of the ocean who get drafted in to help salvage a crashed nuclear submarine. But when they get cut off from the surface by an unexpected storm, it soon becomes clear that the special forces team sent in to help them have their own agenda, and that the sub may have been chasing something from another world. With the script ready by the end of 1987, it was time to find a place to shoot the movie's underwater sequences. Cameron's initial plan was to film in the open ocean off the Bahamas until he realised that this was a fucking terrible idea. Steven Spielberg's experiences with Jaws a decade earlier persuaded him that he needed a more controllable environment to do his movie in. That's when he discovered an abandoned nuclear power plant in South Carolina. It turned out that the reactor containment vessel was big enough to hold 7.5 million gallons of water, which was more than enough for him. By painting the sides black and covering the surface with a giant tarpaulin, they were able to make it look like the bottom of the deep ocean. Naturally, safety was a bit of a concern for this one, so the cast and crew had to go through extensive diving training to prepare for the shoot. Ed Harris really took this shit seriously, and he was close to professional level by the time they were done. The actors playing the SEAL team even went through separate military grade training to prepare them. Everything was looking good, and cast and crew were in high spirits when principal photography began in August 1988. These high spirits lasted for about a day. Just as they were filming their first scenes, the main tank burst apart, losing 150,000 gallons of water a minute. Specialised dam experts had to be brought in to repair it, delaying the shoot by more than a week. Not a great start, and things didn't get much better from there. See, it turns out that having an enormous tank full of stagnant, unfiltered water just sitting there for weeks on end is the perfect breeding ground for algae. Pretty soon, the fucking stuff was everywhere, clouding the water to the point that the cameras couldn't see more than a few feet in front of them. The solution? Chlorine, and lots of it. Chlorine, eh? <laughs> Too much, as it turned out. The water became so saturated with chemicals that it would burn exposed skin and turn hair white. An unexpected storm lifted the tarpaulin right off the tank and tore it apart, forcing Cameron to switch to night shoots to keep the production going. Needless to say, this wasn't exactly popular with the cast and crew, and tempers soon began to fray. The situation was made even worse by Cameron himself, who already had a reputation as a perfectionist and had clashed frequently with his crew on the set of Aliens. Things were ten times worse now though, and actors would often find themselves waiting around for hours or even days while Cameron fought to set up the perfect shot he had in mind. As Michael Bain later admitted, I was in South Carolina for five months, but I think I was only shooting for about three weeks. Working days could last up to 16 hours. Frustrated and impatient with all the delays, Cameron instructed his actors to urinate in their diving suits rather than waste time resurfacing. Fuck knows what you would do if you needed a dump. Yeah! 
Weirdly, the chemical breathing fluid that you see in the film's climax is real stuff that actually works. The scene where they test it on a pet rat was done for real. That animal was actually breathing liquid air. Unfortunately, they weren't allowed to use this stuff on humans, so Ed Harris had no option but to hold his breath inside a helmet full of it while they filmed his underwater scenes. Apparently, it caused his eyeballs to swell up and he kept choking when it went up his nose. Yeah, fuck that shit. Because there was no way to realistically simulate bullet impacts in clear water using squibs, the scene where a character fires a submachine gun into a sub bay was done using live ammunition, something which was extremely dangerous and almost unheard of by that point. Giant gas burners that were brought in to help keep the tank warm did absolutely fuck all in reality, and being constantly immersed in near freezing water led to frequent bouts of hypothermia, plus ear and sinus infections amongst the cast and crew. One of the first scenes shot was the water tentacle that mimics the faces of the actors to give ILM enough time to process the visual effects. This was actually kind of a dry run for the liquid metal effects used in Terminator 2. The problem was, nobody was sure whether it would actually work, so the script was rewritten to ditch the scene if it didn't pan out. Needless to say, this combination of extremely long shooting days in freezing, chlorine-infested water with an aggressively perfectionist director who spent most of his time yelling at everyone around him began to take its toll on the actors. Ed Harris was driving home one night when he suddenly started sobbing uncontrollably and had to pull over to avoid crashing. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio completely lost her shit during the scene where her character has to be resuscitated. See, it turns out that lying on a freezing cold floor, shirtless and soaking wet, while Ed Harris slaps and screams at you for 10 hours isn't all that fun. Who knew? After one particularly intense shot, she promptly decided, fuck this, and stormed off the set, telling Cameron that he'd have to do the rest of the scene without her. Michael Bain was at the bottom of the tank when the entire set suffered a power failure, killing his radio link and his lights. According to him, it was so dark that he couldn't see his hand in front of his face, or even tell which way was up. The stressed and overworked film crew even began referring to the movie as The Abuse. Tensions eventually reached breaking point when the cast collectively lost their minds and started destroying their dressing rooms, punching holes in the walls and throwing furniture out the windows. As Ed Harris later admitted, we just had to get our frustrations out. But if things were bad for the cast, they were about to get a whole lot worse for Cameron himself. He was tethered to the bottom of the tank one day, setting up his next shot, but he was so preoccupied with his work that he forgot to check his oxygen gauge and promptly ran out of air. His attempts to radio for help fell on deaf ears, literally, because the guy man in the radio had had both his eardrums shattered in a diving bell accident. <laughs> you just can't make this shit up, man. With no response and no air left, Cameron ditched his gear, held his breath and swam for the surface about 30 feet above until a helpful safety diver spotted him and gave him his spare regulator, which turned out to be broken and did nothing but squirt water down his throat. The more Cameron tried to break away from him, the more the guy assumed that he was panicking and held him back, until Cameron resorted to punching him in the face so that he could swim clear. He was almost unconscious by the time he finally broke surface and had to be carried out of the tank. But two things happened by the end of that day. Cameron was right back to shooting as if nothing had happened, and the diver and the radio operator were both fired. Filming finally wrapped after a grueling 140 day shoot, leaving behind an exhausted cast and a movie that was already millions of dollars over budget. Ed Harris was so burned out by his experiences that he refused to help promote the movie or even give interviews about it. He later said, I'm never talking about it and I never will. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio was equally pissed off, saying, The abyss was a lot of things, fun to make was not one of them. Even Cameron himself admitted that the shoot had been a total nightmare. I knew this was going to be a hard one, but even I had no idea just how hard. I don't ever want to go through this again. Ironically enough, less than 10 years later he'd be doing another movie that involved copious amounts of water. He must just be a glutton for punishment, I guess. Ultimately, while The Abyss wasn't exactly a flop, it proved to be one of the few box office misses of James Cameron's career, opening at number two and going on to earn less than a hundred million dollars. Personally, while it's definitely not one of my favourites, I still think it's a pretty cool film overall. The sheer work that went into the underwater sequences is impressive, 
and the special effects still hold up pretty well today. The problem is that it occupies a kind of a lacklustre middle ground in his body of work. Lacking the visual spectacle of movies like Titanic and Avatar, the intense action of Aliens, or the strong, memorable characters of Terminator. But just like Francis Ford Coppola, who soldiered on with Apocalypse Now despite the entire production collapsing around him, I have to respect James Cameron for his sheer fucking determination to get this movie made. He's clearly a guy who expects a lot from his cast and crew, probably a bit too much at times, but he also seems to give a lot himself and never asks people to do things that he wouldn't. And that willingness to push the boundaries has resulted in some of the best action films of all time. That being said, I wouldn't want to fucking work for the guy. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.